operation of placer mine uh, streams in Western Montana? Oh, yeah. And uh, before, can you do that, Mark? Okay. Uh, before he starts, uh, I would like to introduce him just in a few words. So he is a project manager for Job Unlimited in Missoula for TU's Clark Fork River uh, project. Since 2004, Rob has worked in Western Montana on projects that benefit cold water fish with a focus on hard rock and placer mine reclamation. His other interest areas are stream restoration, revegetation, native plants, fish passage and fish screen technology, and agriculture improvement projects that benefit in-stream flow or riparian habitats. Rob partners with U.S. Forest Service, numerous Montana state agencies, community watershed groups, and city slash county municipalities, and serves as a catalyst in project development, taking the lead on fundraising partnerships, development, contracting, and construction oversight. He considers it a privilege to blend art with science in the process of ecological restoration. So please welcome uh, Rob. The stage is from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So when I'm going to move slides, do I need to use this uh, computer up here to change photos? You can put Mark in there and then he can show us. <laughs> I'm not going to make him do that. Uh, thanks for having me guys again. My name is Rob Roberts. I work with Trout Unlimited. I'm a full-time staff member out of, out of uh, Missoula, Montana, and I've been doing this for about uh, 12 years. Um, as Robert said, you know, basically what I do is I am sort of the jack of all trades that uh, makes projects happen on the ground. That can be anywhere from grant writing to actually doing some sampling or monitoring or um, construction oversight, landowner negotiations, uh, the whole gamut. So um, I have a pretty interesting position in that I get to do a lot of diverse types of activities in the, in the course of this work. So um, when Robert asked me to come you know, and give him a topic, I thought I'd talk about plaster mine restoration. You know, I work on fish passage. I work on agricultural uh, irrigation efficiency projects. Um, you know, anything that basically relates to fish habitat and water quality or fisheries, or fisheries improvement. But sort of the focus of what I've done over the last 12 years has been related to mine reclamation in western Montana. And um, placer mine reclamation is sort of a really interesting topic because it, it, um, it blends so many different uh, diverse sets of, of science and practice from biology to geology to hydrology to sociology and everything in between. So that's sort of why I thought I'd focus on this. Um, so before I get started, uh, if anyone has any questions along the way, comments, please feel free, just interrupt, raise your hand. Um, I don't need to be a talking head up here for, for 40 minutes, though I'll gladly do it. Um, and I guess before we get started, could a few of you just pop up and tell me kind of how you're even here what your background is. I don't even know uh, exactly who I'm dealing with in the room and where, you know, where the, the knowledge base is. So how about you right here? I'm a biology major. Is everyone a biology major or no? No. Okay. That's what I need to know. All right. What about you? I actually work with your mind. Okay. She knows more than I do about this stuff. What about you? Retired forester. Okay. And you in the back? Uh, I work in the restoration program at East Somerville, the county government. Okay, great. Cool. All sorts of different people here today. So, um, yeah, a lot of you probably know more about some of this stuff than I do, so please forgive me if I, you know, pretend in, in parts of it. But, um, so maybe, you know, more for the students here than some of the practitioners, I thought I'd start off by showing just a few pictures and have you tell me what you see, um, you know, the power of observation in this process is incredibly important, um, and it also kind of helps me gauge what, you know, where we're at. So, what do you guys see in this photo? Just, it doesn't matter what it is. Native rock. Native rock? A creek. A dog. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a wolf, actually. <laughs> Anyone else? What kind of vegetation? It's cedar trees. Uh -huh. And uh, aspirin and 
doctor. You're not a student. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, yep. How big would you say the rocks are in the creek? Big or small? Good answer. What about this one? What? All right. Anyone else? That's all you see? Large woody debris. Yep. More cedar. Yep. Properly functioning. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what about that one? <clears throat> what was that? Broken trees. Broken trees. So big or small rocks? <coughs> right. Could be old beaver, old beaver dams. Or clogged with tailings. <laughs> oh. Giving it away. What about this one here? Yep. What about the vegetation in this one? Pretty heavily browsed brush. <coughs> How do you know that? Well, uh, just by the, the form of the uh, bush, the uh, shrubs. Or the fact that there's a fence going through the middle of the picture? Well, I mean, Is that <laughs> no, I, mean, I miss that. <laughs> I don't know what's on this side of the fence, but I mean, that, the other side looks that way. Yeah. And I think there's maybe one more. Okay, what about this one? <coughs> Open a bottom pipe, it looks like. Good fish, fish passage. Yeah. What do you guys see for vegetation in this one? Yeah. Or, or lack of it. What would lack of it have to do with what we see? Dewatering. So, um, let me see where I was going with this. Yeah, so this, um, this creek right here is Cedar Creek in western Montana near Superior. And if you pan to the right, that's what you see right there. So that picture was taken just, you know, kind of beyond those piles. So what I'm going to talk about today is placer mine restoration. This is a pretty prime example of a small placer mine in western Montana. It's pretty locally isolated. It's just about an acre or so. And the reason you can tell it's placer mine is, I mean, obviously, if you know what you're looking at, there's big piles there. I'll talk a little bit about placer mining in a second, briefly. But you can see this really nice gradation of material from small to big, small to big, small to big. And that kind of shows you the process as they're digging into the stream bottom of how they're hitting different layers of the stream and pushing it to the side, trying to get, up, trying to, get to the gold they're after. So this project here, um, someone said properly functioning. That happens to be that site before. This is what it looked like before we removed that culvert and the road that was on top of it. So, if you look back at this photo, I know this is a placer mine restoration, but you can see the cedar tree on the right. There's the cedar tree on the right. The other thing that gives it away is the fact that there's no trees or vegetation along that middle strip right there. It's all grasses that have come in. So obviously some kind of disturbance happened there, which in this case was hopefully a good disturbance. Um, this gets back into placer mining, and this is Nine Mile Creek, Main Stem Nine Mile Creek. This is the big project that I kind of cut my teeth on. Um, and that's what Nine Mile Creek looks like if you look at it from above. So this is the results of a LIDAR flight that is basically, you know, a, a topo survey flight that gives you really detailed imagery of what uh, a landscape looks like in its elevations. So. This is pretty classic dredge or placer mining right here, where you have these 
very long parallel pits or runs with high piles next to them. So this is basically an undulating landscape that goes like this, up and down all across the floodplain. And some of these piles, which we'll talk more about, are anywhere from 20 to 30 feet high. Um, so you can imagine um, what, that, what that does to a landscape in terms of its biology, hydrology, geology. It basically turns a landscape over and turns it into a big gravel pile, in this sense, case which is flat. And this is Little McCormick Creek. It's, a, a, it's one of the case studies we're going to talk about during this um, project. So here's kind of what Little McCormick Creek looks like 70 years after it was plaster mined. Uh, there's still no water in the creek. The vegetation has barely come back. There's lots of noxious weeds, and obviously there's little to no topsoil at all um, still available for, for vegetation and floodplain function. So Little McCormick Creek uh, is a tributary of Nine Mile. That's, that picture was taken right up there at the top of the photo with the yellow arrow. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Nine Mile Creek and where they mined both hard rock and plaster mining is if you see these foothills coming here and this vegetation line coming across the valley, that's the Nine Mile Fault that runs on the east north side of Nine Mile Creek. And all of these mines that we're working on happen to be basically right where that fault hits these tributaries. So I'm not a miner, but I know enough to know that these guys were after whatever was going on at that fault zone, that there was some kind of mineralization that, that they were chasing at each of these different sites. So throughout these tributaries, there's essentially a mine at every one of these areas right where the fault hits the bottom of these tributaries. So a little bit about plaster mining just before we get into it and you know the damage it caused and how we're rectifying it. Um, for those of you that don't know, plaster mining basically means that they are mining uh, alluvium, stream bed sediments, as opposed to hard rock mining is mining a vein or an ore body you know, in a mountainside, tunneling underneath, down, somehow getting at it. <coughs> plaster mining is actually moving large amounts of cobble and gravel and boulders and everything that is eroded through the mountains over time, and somehow there is gold that has weathered in those same mountains in the same process and is, is, has fallen out or, you know, been layered somewhere in that floodplain. So, um, you know, a lot of this happened in the 30s and 40s in the Depression era. That's when they were using, you know, this is a floating dredge on the right, and they were basically employing people and putting people to work looking for gold. So they basically use these, you know, humongous buckets or dredges in this case and are scooping up all of the floodplain material separating it through basically gravity and shooting rocks and boulders out the other side and then and then looking for gold in, in the finer sediments and the smaller particles that separate out. Um, and they did this over large, large landscapes. Uh, the project that I showed on Nine Mile Creek, that was about five miles long where they essentially mined from valley wall to valley wall in those concentric lines. There's places in uh, Virginia City in Montana uh, where you'll see some of this Yankee Fork of the Salmon down in Idaho, um, where you see you know miles and miles of this stuff. Um, the stuff that they used on Little McCormick Creek and some of these smaller tributaries looks more like that right there. They didn't, you know, there wasn't enough actual groundwater to use a floating dredge, so they used essentially what looks like a humongous excavator to to mine some of this stuff, and that's about the extent of my knowledge of how it actually works. So again, here's what it kind of looks like. Uh, this was first mined in the 1940s, then again in, I think it was the 1970s, and basically left after that. Um, without any vegetation, without a functioning floodplain, there's been really no opportunity for, for soils to develop, for vegetation to develop, for a natural hydrology to develop. So we, what we're left with is a stream channel that doesn't really hold water, um, a floodplain that doesn't have plants, it doesn't have soil, and obviously there's really no aquatic life as a result because there's no habitat to support it. There's no really fish or wildlife um, at these sites. Uh, interestingly enough, when we did this project, 
We, when we dug down to bedrock, which is about 15 to 20 feet below this spot right here, there was a stream running underneath of this, underneath, you know, on that bedrock. So the water was there. It's just because they had turned all this material around basically in a big mixer and then dumped it back in this valley that it's, the water just seeped right through to the bottom and continued flowing when it hit bedrock, you know, 20 feet below the surface. Um, the other interesting thing to note, this stream bed here, this valley, used to be up here. So this used to be the top of the valley, 10 feet above where the stream is right now. So you can imagine what happened when all that 10 feet layer of sediment uh, and gravel moved downstream, where that settled out, and what ramifications that had on stream seg segments down below. So um, what that looks like, in a, you know, I brought up some cross sections from our survey. Um, the survey at the top, basically the blue line is what your water surface would be. You know, at the time of your survey, your red line is what your bank full or your floodplain level would be, uh, you know, based on modeling. So you can see our channel is about 10 to 12 feet wide, and then we have hillsides that go up 15 feet on either side. So in terms of a naturally functioning stream, we would see in western Montana where you normally have a, you know, a floodplain and, and terrace slopes, um, this doesn't have really any of that. It's, it's set down inside uh, this steep valley, and like I said, that's because I can't reach that high, but the stream used to be about 10 feet higher than it, than it is right now. Um, this is downstream of the site. I talked about 10 feet of material being mined and weathered over time and pushed downstream and what might happen. <coughs> this is what happens right here. So if you look from left to right, we're at 15 here and 70 here. This is our water surface elevation. So we have a channel that up here is 12 feet wide and up here, down here it's 60 feet wide. So again, you can imagine what ramifications that has for fish and wildlife and plants and everything else that we're trying um, to regenerate in, in these areas. So in terms of what we actually do at these sites, um, Placid mining projects are, to start with, pretty large earthwork projects. It took a lot of earth moving to do what they did. They moved <coughs> a lot of dirt to get at the gold. You have to move a lot of dirt to try and put it back in some semblance of what the valley or what the landscape looked like before it happened. So um, you can see here, this is a, a project called Matty V Creek, which is the other project I'll be talking about. Um, this is the start of our earth moving. Uh, just to get this valley shaped the way we want it into some kind of historical proportion, we had to move uh, 20,000 cubic yards of dirt. That was before we even moved a rock or you know, put a plant in the ground. That was just our, our basic grading. So you know, for you guys that don't do that, this kind of work, that's basically 2,000 dump truck loads worth of dirt just, just to get started. After that, we bring in a bunch of rock because there isn't any on site. It's all been moved off, off of site because of the mining or been buried somewhere else. We didn't find any while we were moving all this dirt. So uh, we bring in you know, several loads of big boulders, which is basically going to serve as what we call our grade control in our stream channel restoration project. Um, these streams are generally high gradient, meaning like 5 to 10 percent. That's a high mountain stream. Um, if you just carve a stream channel with an excavator bucket through unconsolidated material, it's going to go crazy and haywire on you. Um, it's either going to downcut or it's just going to erode everything downstream and you're going to have wasted your time moving 20,000 cubic yards of dirt to begin with. So, um, we actually place rocks at what, what is called below scour depth, so several feet down where the stream doesn't have enough energy to actually <coughs> scour below that and move those rocks out. Those rocks are essentially the foundation for our stream channel. After that, we come in and build our actual step pools or our stream structure. So 
Uh, a five to ten percent stream is called a step is generally a step pool channel, meaning that it cascades and kind of you know tumbles down the mountain because it is so steep. So we use a series of what are called weirs, either with big boulders or logs, to form those drop pool structures, sort of like you would see in a in a natural setting. You would see water cascading over fallen trees or over pieces of bedrock or large boulders. Um, that does a number of things. One, the pools that it forms behind the boulders, these deep pools, dissipates energy in your stream channel. So you're reducing the amount of energy and the velocity of the water moving down your stream. So the potential energy that could erode your new stream banks in your channel. And it, you know, from a biological perspective, that's where you see the greatest fish habitat is with pool depth and, and cover. Um, well, this slide was supposed to be earlier. So um, I talked about the nine mile fault and some of the water issues we had. Uh, there were some students from tech who actually came out to Little McCormick Creek in 2000 seven, I think it was, or 2008, and used ground penetrating radar to uh, survey what our bedrock system was for Little McCormick Creek, and this is what they found. So this is moving downstream. Alluvium represents the, the stream or the floodplain, and you can see that upstream of the nine mile fault, it's you know eight to 10 feet deep, and once it hits the fault, it drops off to 20 or 30 feet deep. So coincidentally, this is exactly where we saw most of our major water loss. So the water, because the bedrock system was high, was staying on the surface. As soon as we hit the fault, because they had mined there and, and interrupted you know, all this alluvium, the water cascaded through it and didn't pot and then settled on bedrock, which was too deep to actually keep it on the surface. Our groundwater system was too deep. So we had, a, we had an interesting conundrum on Little McCormick Creek because we had a dry stream channel for uh, 10 months of the year. It basically was wet in May and June, and after that it went bone dry for about 1,000 feet. And it didn't seem to be a lot of point to reconstructing pools and logs and bringing plants in if we had a dry stream. Um, so we had to figure out what we were going to do about it. And we used a technique that we had experimented in a couple places, which we called groundwater retention sills. And essentially what we did, um, if you look at this picture on the left, that's looking upstream, coming down. Um, that's our restored stream as we're building it. And every 100 feet, we actually dug down to bedrock, which was about 20 feet deep dug from valley wall to valley wall so we could, we could intercept control points. And then what we dug was basically a large trench. And then we backfilled it with a geosynthetic textile, which you can see on the right-hand side. So essentially what we did is we built a big groundwater dam. Um, the theory being that the groundwater is there. It's just on bedrock 15 to 20 feet below us. If we build a dam, that water will back up, come to the surface, and then spill over top of that geosynthetic, which is where the bottom of our stream channel should be. So we're basically creating artificial springs. Um, Historically, do you think that's what this group did before? Do I think it was actually a perennial stream channel? Yeah, or for a flow of more than two months out of the year. Right, that's a great question. Uh, and some people um, debated that and asked us that. The best we can go by are the tributaries that are nearby, mm -hmm. which have the same aspect, same watershed size, you know, uh, similar hydrology. And most of those that haven't been mined do run perennially. Okay. So um, we believe it was because we found this problem at multiple places where it had been, been placer mined. In places that hadn't, we usually had perennial stream channels in its drainage. So that was our assumption. So, you know, a couple problems with this. One, you're leaving a, a, you know, a synthetic material in, in the ground, uh, let's just say forever. I don't, you know, I don't know what the half-life of it is, but it's there. Uh, 
We looked at bringing in clay or bentonite and trying the same thing, and the cost was just incredibly prohibitive to import that much, you know, material, a natural material that would form the same water-type barrier. Um, we also had problems actually getting this material to seal on the bottom, on bedrock. So, you know, as we were building this and installing it, the water, as you can see, is creeping into our trench, which means that our synthetic is floating. So, uh, our operator had to be really fast and handy at how he installed this and backfilled it at the same time while trying to get that thing to actually seal on the bottom of our valley both on bedrock and on the valley walls. And we, you know, we installed it in such a way that, you know, we called this a smile. So obviously our dam is not straight across. Our dam is meant to concentrate water in the middle, middle of the valley moving downstream. And if you could look at the cross section, our geosynthetic was higher on the valley walls and lower in the middle as well. So in two different ways, horizontally and vertically, vertically trying to push that water into where our stream, our new stream channel should be. So this is what uh, Little McCormick looked like at that site, now looking downstream immediately after we installed one of these groundwater retention sills. You can see some of the material still poking out on the right uh, after being backfilled, and we already have water popping up in the surface and starting to trickle into our stream channel. So at least in the short term, this appeared to be working. Um, the next thing we do at these plaster mine sites, um, like I talked about, we're basically bulldozing a valley, you know? So there's nothing left. This is a blank slate. It's a blank canvas. We've now worked on our water situation. The next thing we actually have to do, or I'm sorry, we, we worked on our water, we worked on our stream channel and its grade control and the roughness and what the, you know, the step pull system of the actual channel. Now we actually have to try and build some banks, you know, so that we, we don't have erosion, so that our stream at high water actually holds together. We can grow vegetation, which improves shade, improves water temperatures, increases wildlife habitat, so on and so on. So um, we generally have to build our own topsoil structure. We don't have it there. It's all been, you know, moved. It's long gone. So one of the things we do besides importing some nutrients is screen the existing soil on site. So we actually bring in some screens and you can see in the top left, that's, you know, that's the finer material that we were able to find on site after, after screening, um, you know, the, basically the dirt that, that was there. Moving to the top right, um, you guys may have seen techniques like this or similar to this before. Um, you know, people call them bioengineered banks or soil lifts or, you know, there's different names for them. Uh, soil burritos, I think I've heard before. But essentially, you have your stream channel built with all your rocks. You have a rock toe along your bank. And then you come in and lay several layers of um, biodegradable fabric uh, and then backfill that with soil or screened soil. Um, and lay a layer of willows underneath and on top. Stake, you can see they're staking down this fabric with uh, wooden wedges, which is an incredibly laborious process. Um, and then down here, once all this fabric is wrapped back, you have this stage. We're laying a lot, another layer of willow cuttings, four to six feet long, on top of it. And then on this site, we actually brought in container stock from a nursery and then laid a, um, uh, a hose, what do you call it? A, uh, yeah, like a drip irrigation hose winding throughout the bottom of this trench at the base of our willows and next to all, next to all of our container stock. <coughs> and we actually ran that based on a gravity feed from, from the stream upstream. So, this, uh, this here on your left is what the stream channel looks like after we bulldoze the area. We've put in our rocks, our logs, some of our root wide clusters for habitat and roughness. 
You can see there's no water in the stream yet because it's diverted. We're working in the dry um, to, to decrease you know, our turbidity and sediment impacts to the stream. We then laid our, our fabric rolls on top of our stream banks on either side. And you can see this here is basically what a stream bank looks like with all our willow cuttings after it starts to grow back. There's some water in the stream now. Um, this is Little McCormick Creek, again, the bottom end with no vegetation or no water. So now I'm getting into a series of before and afters. Uh, Little McCormick Creek at the bottom. That's Little McCormick Creek after the stream channel has been built. Some of these uh, bioengineered banks and willow cuttings have been brought in. We've laid uh, branches and small trees for roughness along the floodplain, incorporated clump transplants. And then that's what the site looks like two years later after we start to get grass developing. Uh, our shrubs start to take root and leaf out. We now have a flowing stream channel because our groundwater sills are, you know, are working for at least most of the year and maintaining a wetted channel. <clears throat> What's the distance between the dams and the groundwater cells? Yeah, good question. I was going to cover that. Um, so that depends on gradient. So uh, what you can do is basically build a, uh, you know, an elevation profile of what your stream looks like and what, what your pro projected uh, you know, groundwater increase is at each one of these stations. And this channel itself, it was about every 150 feet or, or so on thereabouts. So I think we did five or six on the last thousand feet uh, of this channel. What, what would a hundred year flood event do to that channel? Because of the groundwater retention cells well, or just? I mean, just because of the, with the additional. In general. Yeah. So, 100 year flood event, um, you know, just what he's asking in case you guys, you know, don't know is he's basically asking like, you know, generally what you look at when you're building a stream is you build this elevation right here so that it floods at an average two year flood event. So every other year or so, the water's coming up, spilling out over the banks and, you know, getting it nice and wet, but not causing too much damage. A hundred year flood event is what happens when you get so much water that it happens once every hundred years. So now you've got a new stream channel you just built, raw banks, raw floodplain, uh, you know, not a lot of root cohesion, um, and you get this massive impulse of water. Well, what happens is a really good question. You know, these projects you generally try and build or model for at least a 50 year flood event. Um, it's pretty hard to build them for a 100 year flood event because even a natural system in a 100 year flood event is going to go haywire. That's the whole point. You know, it's, a, it's an epic setting event that totally changes the landscape. But so for a 50 year or greater flood event, that's why you're using you know, A, large boulders in the stream that are probably bigger than what would happen, what would occur naturally in this kind of system. You're burying them below scour depth, so they're protected from these massive hydraulics that happen in the stream at these events. We have two layers of fabric, one inner layer which is holding the soil, the second layer which is kind of serving as the really strong layer that's holding everything together. They were... Um, we have the uh, stakes driven into the ground, and then they're backfilled over top. So basically, you're building this stream to try and weather the eventuality that some major flood event is going to happen in the next 10 years, 15 years. And then on your floodplain, you're not only trying to get vegetation to establish quickly with willow cuttings, transplants, seed, soil amendments, but bringing in trees, brush, rocks, and trying to create roughness so that if the water does spill out and really start to move down this valley, um, that it's not just a flat blank slate, but it's actually incurring resistance as it, as it moves throughout the valley. 
Um, but, you know, sometimes things go wrong and, you know, projects like this have been totally obliterated because the year after they build it, a hundred year flood event came through. Right? Um, it's, it's pretty hard to guard against something like that. So, um, this is back to Matty V Creek. This is what it looked like after we moved 20,000 cubic yards of material. You can see we just excavated a, you know, the very beginnings of a stream channel. We have the water diverted around it so that we're not working in the wet. That's what the same spot looks like after we brought in rocks and trees and everything else that not only functions for habitat, but functions to um, protect against flood events. That's what the stream looks like the following year after runoff. So you can see I talked about a step pull channel, and you can see we have this kind of cascading system. Every 10 feet or so, there's a drop. So that's reducing energy. Um, and where we have these drops, it's scouring and, and creating pools. And you know this isn't this isn't high enough yet this spring to have any overbank flooding where it's actually wetting your vegetation and, and dropping out sediment and, and soil and seed. And then this is the same project in July. We put up a deer fence, eight foot high deer fence. It is actually more of a moose fence than a deer fence um, to protect all our new vegetation from being eaten. You can see all the plants grass, willows starting to green up on the side. We actually buried some old cottonwood stumps that were on the project to uh, basically create bird perching habitat along the stream and to give the stream some kind of, some profile to it so that it wasn't just a big flat field. And that's what the project looked like last year, about five years after um, we constructed the project. So um, you can see our willows are now 10 feet high and leafing out. Alders that were either planted or from seed coming in. Forbs along the stream channel. Micro sites inside the stream for fish and other wildlife habitat. Woody debris for cover or shade for also fish and wildlife habitat. Um, and generally, it's fairly hard to tell from this angle that you're at a stream that was, you know, restored or reconstructed unless you kind of see this pretty obvious distinction between the 200-year-old larch and cedar in the background and our puny little 10-foot-high willows. So uh, here's the same project looking from upstream. Uh, that photo that I just showed you is taken down here, looking up. So before the project started, here's the site with all our boulders on the banks and in the stream, some of our wood roughness before the banks have been built. And then um, on the right there, the first spring, showing everything, starting to leaf out. And that's what it looked like about two years after um, we did the project. I do have a photo from the same spot five years later, but you can't actually see anything because it's just a wall of vegetation. So it doesn't really look very impressive. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, I think you know we talked about leaving a little bit of time for questions or discussion, and uh, I'm happy to answer. You know, any questions about these projects or anything else, or, or hear your guys' point of view on some of this stuff? You would suspect that those groundwater dams sooner or later are going to fail. Are you counting on the stream bed itself getting enough fines in there to seal it to keep the water on top, or is it always a, the water from the groundwater that's going to feed that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know we have an answer to that. You know, so at some point, you know, one or two of those did fail immediately, so we did not get them to adequately seal against the bottom of the, the bedrock of the valley. And we don't know if that's because it was fractured bedrock or if we just didn't install them well, you know, and they had folds in them or something when they were put down. 
But yeah, all we can hope is over time that because now we've, we've built a stream that actually has a naturally functioning floodplain and the processes of hydrology versus what was there beforehand, which was kind of this big field of gravel, that we will eventually create some kind of lens of you know clay or sediment that actually holds you know water through through the year. But you didn't seal the you didn't seal the stream bed in between there using bed. No, no, nope. no, nope. nope. we didn't do any of that. Um, it's just I think technically too difficult and cost prohibitive to try. I mean, yeah, I mean we fully admit that there's there's probably there's some uh, you know there's some faults and some problems with the system, but. Um, you know, it was a kind of a first attempt to deal with this issue. And this project here actually has uh, one right in the middle, right across this area, right here. There's also a big water <coughs> dam inside of it. And because of it, it has worked perfectly. And we've had a, we've had a perennial stream channel every year since we've done this project. So it's been really good to see. Well, alternatively, you just have to put a floor down with that fabric or something to keep the water up there. So right. You can see that a very good idea. What was your your cost per linear foot? Um, so this project here, you know, the cost. So this is about four hundred feet of stream channel, and the project cost one hundred forty thousand dollars. But that's because we moved twenty thousand cubic yards of material before we actually got to do anything. So if you take that out of the equation, I actually have this exact number somewhere, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I bet you that we did 400 or yeah, four to 500 feet of channel for somewhere in the name, you know, in the area of sixty thousand dollars. So whatever that, whatever the math majors in the room can cut that out to. What is that? One hundred fifty bucks a foot? Or am I off there? Uh, the Little McCormick Creek project was definitely more cost efficient. One, we didn't move as much material. Two, we were really being creative because of a low budget with how we could actually build this project without importing a lot of, you know, rock, geotextile, plants, whatever, what have you. We really tried to use materials we had on hand and uh, we only had one piece of equipment running. Whereas this Maddie V project, we probably had four, you know, at any given time. So uh, I think we did, you know, 2,000 feet of channel on Little McCormick for about the same number, for about $75,000. Did you do the stream design work yourself, or did you hire that? Uh, I did the stream design work on Little McCormick Creek, and this project here was designed by um, Morrison and Marley out of uh, Missoula. So where did you bring the? Uh material in from? Does it matter where the boulders are coming from? Did you pay enough to just match yeah. That's a great question. And someone someone called me out on that. So um, excuse your eyes for a minute. There's a huge truck. In yeah, where was that? Rocks. There. So those are actually granite boulders that came. Uh, they were leftovers from the Milltown Dam reconstruction project. They came out of Hall, Montana. Um, and they do not belong in Nine Mile Creek. They are, they are not of the right geology. Um, and so, someone pointed that out to me in a field tour. And so basically when we did that, not, that Matty V Creek project, we were moving 20,000 cubic yards of material. We're, we filled a pit. I didn't have time to get into this. We filled a pit that was 30 foot deep and then built a stream on top of it. And we thought when we moved 20,000 cubic yards, we were going to find boulders in there. We found about five. In four weeks of moving material, we found five boulders. Um, we did a project next door to Matty V on Twin Creek. Two years later, we found more boulders than we knew what to do. <coughs> they were everywhere. So I have no idea why they didn't show up on Matty V Creek, but they didn't. So we kind of quickly had to import the best material we could find. Um, and that's what we got, rounded granite and mouth. So when you were working with the materials left behind, it was the original creek channel materials that were there to start with. Yep. Did, did you have any other contaminants to look for besides? Uh, yeah, good question. What, what, the contam what did you have any contaminants 
should pay attention to? Right. So, good question. Um, two ways, you know, two ways to look at that. One, let's just say natural contaminants, you know, heavy metals that might have been in the area because of the mining operation. Uh, we generally don't find any of that at plastic <coughs> mine sites. The hard rock mine sites where they're exposing minerals to water and air and creating that chemical process that, that leaches metals out of, out of the hillside. Um, that happens at hard rock sites. Generally doesn't happen at placer sites because you're looking at, you're just looking at inert alluvium, you know, gravel and cobble. Um, the other contaminants that you can potentially come across, mercury. Uh, mercury was heavily used to amalgamate gold in a lot of these placer mining areas as well as hard rock. You know, it bonds to gold and then that, that's what they take to actually process. Um, so we never found any, but I've heard of people finding mercury in either pockets or drums of it in some of these sites. Um, cyanide can be, you know, barrels can be found in these sites. And then, you know, all the rest of the crap, diesel, you know, oil barrels, anything that was, you know, just buried as they were moving this stuff. Uh, we've been fortunate we never, we never came across anything. We never, you know, we never had a leak at any of these projects so far, not that we'll. Anyone else? Go ahead, back there. Um, so I don't think the placer miners moved the boulders. So the original creek didn't have big boulders in it. Do you have any sense of what the original creek looked like? Um, yes. So for both of these projects, generally, uh, someone asked about design earlier. You know, generally, what the kind of the philosophy we're using is is looking at a reference channel, and so usually we can go upstream of these mining areas where it hasn't been mined. Um, so the channel is in a somewhat historic condition. Um, Matty B Creek would not be a boulder-dominated channel. Uh, it's it's more of a uh, root control system. So there's a really, it's a, it's a north facing slope with really dense canopy cover, cedar, larch, spruce, you know, big diameter old trees. And that's basically what's holding the stream together, keeping it from eroding and, and moving around. Um, Little McCormick is on the north, or, or is this, is south facing, so Matty B faces north, Mc Little McCormick faces south, gets all the direct sunlight. It does not have a big canopy of old mature trees. It's much flashier, um, steeper hillsides. So that's Little McCormick, you do find this, this much more big substrate, boulder dominated kind of stream channel. Um, so Matty V, our reference channel didn't have boulders. The problem is we really couldn't recreate a 200 year old spruce and cedar forest for 500 feet. We had to do the next best thing. Um, and we decided that that was basically building this, um, this analog channel using, using boulders and, and large material. As to why the boulders weren't there, I don't have the slightest idea. You know, I mean, they just weren't. And, they're somewhere, you know, they're somewhere in the vicinity and only someone that's, you know, a hundred years old knows where they are that was doing work. <coughs> Has the post-restoration fishery mining been affected at all by the dispersal or spawning? Yeah, good question, Mark. So, where are we? Again, I'm going to fly through this and get to the end. So in terms of fisheries monitoring post-project, uh, we did fish population sampling uh, upstream of the project in our reference area as well as in the project area. So we had a control um, and a project area. What we saw is that in Matty V Creek right here, we saw a very quick um, occupants of this new habitat by both West Slope Cutthroat and Brook Trout. So, Brook trout are not native to the area, but they were in all these headwater streams because we think the miners actually dumped them there back in the day for, you know, it was a food supply. Um, so they're there. So even though this stream, Matty V Creek right here, hadn't been connected to Nine Mile Creek for 80 years, there were brook trout up above that were not able to connect to Nine Mile Creek. 
And there were also some cutthroat, there's cutthroat in Nine Mile Creek. When this was reconnected for the first time in 80 years to allow fish passage, we saw basically both species move in at about the same rate uh, post project. And the density of fish in the new project was much, much higher than actually what was in our control reach. Probably because you're getting a lot of primary productivity based upon sunlight and, you know, versus this kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, more stagnant habitat upstream. So you looked at other channels prior to building this. What kind of data did you collect? I mean, to uh, reconstruct this segment. So, um, oh shit. Sorry. Where am I? So generally, the data we're going to collect on a stream like this is we're going to go into the existing channel and um, collect cross sections across the valley. It tells us what our floodplain looks like, what our channel dimensions are. We're going to collect a long profile, which is down the stream, which shows us what our slope is, uh, what our kind of plan form configuration, you know, with step pools versus, you know, ripples runs, that sort of thing. Um, and we're going to do the same thing at a reference reach, which we think is generally the same gradient, generally the same kind of discharge, you know, or watershed size, um, and, and model our new channel based upon that. So really what we're looking at is, is basic topographical survey trying to show, uh, you know, gradient, plan and profile, cross-sectional area, uh, floodplain width and, and height, um, and then beyond that, we'll look at some of our biological variables, you know, our, our plant communities, um, as well as our, you know, fisheries population sampling. And it, you know, it all depends on how much money we have and how high profile the project is and, um, and how much pre-data we actually collect. Little McCormick was done in a really tight budget, um, you know, and we did a lot of that in-house and, and did it in a pretty quick and dirty fashion, whereas uh, Maddie V Creek was a little bit more high profile, involved a lot more dirt, dirt work and disturbance, and, and we collected a lot more information and therefore had a lot more documents as, as a result. Well, I think we need to finish. Thank you so much.